Welcome class. Today's lesson is on aquifers. As you've been working with the groundwater uh, uh, simulators in class, one of the concepts you're going to have to really grasp are what are aquifers and the, what are the different types. So this lesson is going to help you understand and identify those different types of aquifers. Well, the lifeblood of any aquifer, of course, is going to be its watershed. Here in California, we have two major watersheds, one in the north and one in the south. But the thing that joins them together, of course, is the Central Valley. The Central Valley is the area in which the majority of all of the recharging or refilling of that aquifer takes place. Because of all the tributaries and various um, watershed systems within the state, it all kind of feeds into two rivers. One, of course, is in the uh, northern part of the state, which is the Sacramento River, and the other one is in the southern part of the state, is the San Joaquin. Because of uh, this vast network of streams, creeks, sloughs, and lakes, mountains, streams, rivers, what have you, they all come together into primarily the delta. If you look at the lower uh, right-hand picture, that vast network and tributaries of, of water uh, waterways is that complex system we uh, call here in California the delta. The delta is a huge wetland area that's very complex, very fragile, and it's one of the major areas in which we recharge our aquifers. Um, of course, we still have, just like in, the, um, in that meadow picture, uh, you'll see that there's, there's a lot of streams and rivers in the spring with, our, um, with snow melt coming off of there to also recharge some of the smaller uh, watersheds. But if you take a look at the vast network of, of needs in our state, as pictured here on the left, you'll notice um, that there are all different kinds of, of uh, water districts, um, also municip municipalities, uh, a huge system of, of levees and dikes and, of course, dams all over the state to control our waterways and control the amount of surface water uh, that runs through the state. But again, uh, as, there is, as we control the surface water, we can also uh, control the groundwater as well so that it can be recharged uh, not only for drinking water but also agriculture as well. And kind of the workhorse of all of this uh, maintenance of our groundwaters and our aquifers is really a little bitty tiny guy. He's about well, even smaller than that, sometimes even microscopic. And those are called pore spaces. Pore spaces are the space in between the soil particles. So before we can even pump water out of the ground to irrigate like this picture depicts, what we have to do is manage that pore space. Um, those little bitty pore spaces are vital in, in all the aquifers. Um, whether it be sand, silt, or clay, they have different sizes, and of course, the different size will lead to the amount of water which a particular unit of volume of soil can hold. For instance, I've got these uh, three pieces of gravel, rocks if you will, which someday will be um, soil particle. And if we take a look at this, this to kind of depicts, if you will, what's really going on. Uh, if these are three particles, if you notice right there in the center, this hole is called a pore space. That's the part in a soil matrix that's either filled up with air or water. If it's in an aquifer, it's probably filled with water, or at least most of the time anyway. As the water table will fluctuate in one of the aquifers, it will be filled up or taken away, depending if it's pumped out or it, get re, it gets recharged by, by some kind of source. So these three particles right here are, of course, uh, the soil mineral, if you will. And this right here would be, of course, the pore space that fills with the water. So that kind of gives you an idea what kind of a, um, the kind of the workhorse of the aquifer is, and, that, and that's that pore space. Now, for water to actually go down into the ground and, and percolate down into the soil, um, when that happens, then we have an aquifer. As water fills up those tiny little pore spaces and fills up that particular area of, of soil, then what we do have is we have an aquifer. And I I'm brought along a model here today to kind of show you that. And here's our model of our aquifer. You notice that this represents, all the little glass beads in here are going to represent soil particles. The green water in here shows you where this water has settled. 
Because of this kind of confining layer on the bottom, the soil can't go any further. Let's call that clay, for instance. So if we were to take a look at where the water table is or the level of water in this aquifer, it's called the water table, you'd see it at 600 uh, milliliters. And with, with that in mind, that looks like there's a tremendous amount of water. But we have to also consider in an aquifer, it's this kind of this body of saturated rock or sediment in which water can kind of move in and out of. And of course, you can see as I turn this, water can move through it. So these pore spaces are large enough to allow that to take place. But how much water can this aquifer hold? Well, one way that we can determine that is by determining the percentage of pore space or porosity. So I'm going to go ahead and pour this water out. And as I do that, we'll be able to somewhat calculate about what the pore space is. So what I'm doing is trying to keep all the, the rocks still in place. Um, pouring out all the water as much as I can. But notice that even though I pour it all out, some of it still sticks to all the soil particles. So even though you can drain it, there are still st still left some water um, in between these pore spaces. It doesn't always ever leave. So when I poured it out, you can see that we have just about 300 uh, mLs. That's roughly a about 50% pore space. And of course in the real world that's probably not not a really good uh, example of that. But it just gives you an, an opportunity to see that even though it looked like it was 600 mLs, a lot of it was, uh, the room was taken up or the volume was taken up by the actual um, uh, matrices of the, of the mineral um, or the mass. So an aquifer is kind of like this sponge. It will soak up water and hold it there, but if we were to kind of squeeze it, you can see that in this sponge, it's, of course, spread out. And what's being filled up in this sponge? That's right, the pore spaces. So, again, an aquifer is just a body of saturated matrix, in particular of rock or some kind of sediment in which water can uh, th uh, flow through. It can be easy to go flow through or hard. Now, when we look at the aquifers themselves, they're different types. I'm going to talk about just two of them, and the one that you'll see on your groundwater uh, model most probably are, are these two. The first one is called uh, an unconfined aquifer, and the model that I showed you today is a good example of an unconfined aquifer. This unconfined aquifer basically um, is open access uh, to the top layer of soil. Maybe on the bottom there is something confined, but for the most part, it's just partially filled with water. You can see that we still have a little bit of what they call headspace um, where this water table is. And um, that means this, this aquifer, aquifer isn't completely filled. And it is exposed to this uh, subsurface marked by this water table right here. And because it really doesn't have any confined layer or it doesn't really have anything pushing down on it, it's basically unpressurized. So water will flow in and out. This water table will go down and up depending on the season, depending on how much um, it's used as far as the pump is concerned. So that's a unconfined aquifer. Uh, if we take a look at our drawing here, this is an, um, the water table right here on this unconfined aquifer. And it's exposed to the open surface right here. And it does kind of have a confining unit to it. In other words, here is a confining layer of clay. And of course, it can't go all the way down. But so it fills up as it gets recharged from a river or a lake or even rain itself. Um, so that would be an unconfined aquifer. Now we have a different kind. Let's suppose, again, using this model, if there was another aquifer beneath this plastic, we'll call this clay for just for lack of a better um, model, anything underneath this would be considered a confined aquifer because it's confined at the top. Whereas this was unconfined at the top, a confining layer or a, conf uh, um, a confined aquifer is confined not only in the top but also on the bottom. So it's pressurized. It's always filled up. So in a confined aquifer situation, it's always filled up, number one. Number two, it's under pressure. So if you've ever traveled the mountains and, and taken a drink from a spring, you'll know that um, 
it, it seems to just continue to kind of pour out. And the reason why it does that is there's a fracture or a break in that confining layer so that it actually scoots through that fracture. And of course, it's under pressure, so it's kind of leaking out under pressure. There's two reasons why it's under pressure. Number one, it's being recharged from a different place. So again, if we take a look at our diagram here, here's a recharge area for the confining aquifer or confined aquifer. Whereas, of course, on the unconfined aquifer, it's just located right over top of the, uh, the uh, aquifer. So this one has two confining layers, one on the top, one on the bottom. And this tends not to, to empty, because if it did, then, of course, all of this would come probably crashing down, and you'd have the, uh, what we call subsidence. The, the water will, the uh, area or land around it would sink. And we see that in, in the southeastern part of the United States uh, from time to time as we have these big sinkholes, and, and that's uh, typically what happens. So the recharge area for the confining layer is different than the one in the unconfined layer. So again, we have a confined aquifer that is surrounded by essentially two confining uh, layers, typically of clay or bedrock or shale or some kind of impermeable layer that, that you know water can't get through very easily. And then we have also the conf unconfined aquifer right here. And that is open to the surface, whereas this one is not. It's enclosed. It's sealed, if you will. So it's under pressure. So if there's a fracture or a break, like right here, water could come through here as a spring. And then, of course, it would uh, run down the hill and maybe form a, um, a small stream, uh, ponds, uh, wetland area, what have you. So um, those are the two kinds of aquifers we're looking at, confined and unconfined. They're basically the difference is unconfined is open um, to the surface of the soil. It's not pressurized. The confining layer has basically two different kinds of impermeable layers surrounding it to keep it under pressure. It doesn't fluctuate uh, much, a little bit, but not much, whereas the unconfined fluctuates a lot. Well, I hope that helps. Um, please make sure you see the other two uh, videos on the basics of groundwater, and those should help you uh, with your uh, lab uh, over the next couple of days. We'll be in the lab going through the groundwater model, and this particular concept on aquifer should help you identify the, the two that we've been talking about. So again, I will be seeing you in the lab in the next few days, and uh, good luck. If you need my help, just let me know. We'll, we'll be there, um, and so we'll see you in the lab. Thanks.